What do you want a story that's believable or do you want the truth? What's going on? How much does our government know? And when did they know it? You were the interface between the government or the military and alien visitors. Would that be correct? That'd be correct. There's a price to pay when you start talking. And I don't want to go into that too much because when you start reliving it, okay? I see. Uh, you have no idea what I'm seeing in my mind right now, just talking the, about the tip of the iceberg. Two or three times I got out of the UFO field. But you want to tell you a little secret? You can't. There are people out there, and I'm one of them. It's not about money. God, I wish it was. We will be going out into the cosmos, visiting other solar systems, other planets outside of our own. But when we do this, it's going to be that we're going to have to have a spiritual heightening. In other words, we're going to have to care what happens to the other guy. Clifford Stone, I'm very happy to be able to interview you here today. And um, there's a great deal of respect for what you've done and for your um, courage in coming forward and talking about it. And it's very exciting to actually get you on camera. Thank you, ma'am. And so um, we're here actually in a really amazing place. This is the Roswell UFO Museum. Do you mind telling us why you, how you ended up in Roswell? Well, the United States Army sent me here. I'm retired military. Okay. So as being retired military, you're always subject to recall. Sure. And you're always subject to possibly being asked things as a consultant. Okay. Well, I retired as a uh, sergeant first class. Now, is your t was your title a clerk? I understand um, that well, was a cover story. Is well, this correct? Well, you actually had you had a real life in the military. You had an actual mission. The only time that this other stuff came into play is when they had a UFO incident that was to occur, and you were in the immediate area of that. And I can tell you, in '65 in Vietnam, there was a base camp there trying to open fire on a UFO. At the very minute they tried to do that, none of their weapons were. All the electricity went out and remained so until after the UFO left. And I can tell you from being in Vietnam for four years, and yes, it was four years, the records reflect, I think, 37 months. But you add up the time of TDY that was over there, it, it's right at four years. Oh, uh, TDY being temporary duty. Not having power on, a, on anything is very, very scary, and those are very, very tense moments. As a communicator, you were called out just in terms of your military life. From what age were, did you start working in this capacity, would you say? Mm -hmm. It was probably at about the age of 19 or 20. Okay. When it comes to people who do interfacing, there's no school for that. There are things that have went on in your life. When I got out, there were seven people that was still in the military that did interfacing. Only seven, and that was military-wide. And I was put into an incident where we had a situation that we weren't told exactly where it was, but I know we landed at uh, uh, Benoit, because when I went back then it was a sign. That's where we, were, where we landed. Benoit, uh, That's in Vietnam. Oh. And uh, I, know it was, I know it was Benoit, because it was the same when I went back. Now, this was an incident that occurred. That was we it a were, crash? Or uh, was it well, a visit? We saw the entities. Okay. And this involved with us going in to try to extract an aircraft. And we did. We cut it up in, I think, s about seven pieces. Okay. Was, and, it, was it one of theirs? No, no, no. This was, this was a B-52. Okay. So... That didn't crash normal. Is this a time travel experiment? No. This was a craft that was shot down. Everybody was killed on, everybody was dead on board the B-52. Shot but, down by the visitors? Well, they were on a bombing mission over, I have no way of knowing this, but I would assume on a bombing mission over North Vietnam. The damage to the craft was as a result of uh, anti-aircraft fire at the B-52. 
I mean, the, the damage was that type. And it was used for conventional bombing. And where I said we went in, we went from there by helicopter. But it was just like some giant hand had grabbed the plane out of midair and just set it on the jungle floor. And that's what we were interested in. Oh. We didn't know, you're not told. Uh, when we got on the plane in the States to leave to go over there, we were told we were going to Florida. <laughs> when we landed in Oakland, we knew we weren't going to go to Florida. But then you went ahead, you was given a little plastic bag. You had to cut U.S. Army off, you had to cut your name tag off. One thing you never do is take your dog tags off. We took the dog tags off. Every item that could identify you went into that plastic bag. That was uh, held for us there at Benoit. But that was held for us there until we came back. But after the event occurred, uh, they put me in this GP uh, medium tent. There was a table there, there was a chair, there was a pad, there was, uh, a, I think, a couple of pens, but I grabbed a pencil. And I was to sit there and just put down my thoughts. Okay. But anyhow, I'm getting back to the tent. That's all it was there. I went ahead, uh, went in, got bored, and I started to play games of tic-tac-toe. Went outside to smoke, took the paper with me, wadded it up, put it in my pocket. When they found that piece of paper, and remember, all it was on it was just little games of tic-tac-toe. Right. Immediately, the guy that I always called the colonel was always there. He came and knocked the cigar out of my mouth and started to cuss at me profusely. What are you doing out here and why do you have that? You can be shot for having that paper in your pocket. Why? It was classified waste. You didn't take paper in there. You took nothing in there. And everything that was in there was to stay there. So everything that was, that I wrote was immediately put into a stat, uh, a uh, briefcase, was taken out of there by special courier. And even though I wrote it, I was no longer cleared to see it anymore. Hmm. Now, did you write things sometimes that you didn't even know you wrote? Yeah, you did. Oh. Like I can tell you right now, everything that I read, uh, I can have a, a greater understanding of some of the stuff I'm doing. Paul can tell you I do a whole lot of stuff as far as downloading. But you know what? I don't have to read every page. But I'll scan every page. Mm -hmm. And while I'm scanning, through me they can pick up on everything that's there. And it's all old news to them. Sure. But they find some things interesting. Mm -hmm. And they'll find some things that are be amusing to them because we're heading in the right direction but we don't have the right eye dotted and if you know anything about mathematical formulas uh, we'll have things in reverse but this right here sometimes scares you because you think gee is this a good because you're being driven to do this so it's, fa it's fascinating that, you know, we don't think of Vietnam and during the war as being a time that we would be also dealing with off-world cultures. You know why? They truly were told to call them helicopters. You were in a war zone, so what you do is you go in and put a Occam's razor in there and you, you eliminate to the lowest denominator. UFOs can exist. Let me rephrase that. UFOs is not a good term. Interplanetary conveyances cannot exist. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something very earthly. NSA went ahead and would call UFOs UFOs when we were monitoring communications with the Soviet Union. But they always qualified that in hopes that with the initiation of the, Sun, of the Sunshine Act, later to become the Freedom of Information Act, that they would not be subject to those acts by saying seven UFOs being reported by such and such location and site, 
But when they'd say seven UFOs, in parentheses, they would put probably balloons. Disregard the fact that in the, the one document I'm talking about, seven UFOs traveling at 1,700 miles an hour. <laughs> balloons can't do that. <laughs> right. And I always got bemused at that because even as a kid, I'd get bemused when people would say, I don't believe in ghosts. However, this happened. Sure. You tell a perfectly good ghost story. <laughs> With me, I very early on knew that to deny the reality of UFOs and other phenomena that occurs would be denying myself. So, so as an as a communicator, you're definitely you do you don't always tell the others what's going on. Remember, I told you you feel it. You, you feel, yes, you feel what they feel, and they feel what you feel. Mm -hmm. And so, you don't always address it, because one of the things that you may feel like, if they're saying that they are a guest, if our military is saying, well, this is one of our guests, uh, they're not treating that entity as a guest. And what's happening is, is that you are feeling what that entity is feeling. Uh -huh. And one situation, I even helped one of them escape, and that right there was <laughs> not telling them everything that was being said. I'm curious what went on when you dealt with that. Was it, first of all, what kind of an entity was it? And I understand that they're being held mm -hmm. prisoner, but how was it that you were able, and in fact, Dan Bursch talks about the same thing. Well. I don't know whether it was a Stargate or what, but in order on the inside where we had this entity, if we were to, uh, and there's a tape that talks about this, which gives a whole lot more detail, but we went ahead, and if they were to try to extract this entity from inside where we were at, then there'd have been people killed. And this entity would not accept that. And you could feel what was going, you could feel what it felt. That's the best way to put it. And I'm trying to tell this without going into any real certain details. But I convinced the person that I always called the Colonel, and all throughout, that's what I always called him. Uh, we went ahead. And I said, you know, he needs to show me something, but everybody has to be cleared from here. It's just got to be me and him. And everybody went ahead, left. Uh, there was one spec spy that stayed there to help me, and I said, we've got to cut this screen uh, fence back here, or this storm fence, and we can get in trouble for that. I says, yeah, I know. That's why I'm asking you to just drop off the uh, uh, bolt cutters and then beat feet. Well, he didn't. He went ahead and he cut the wires for me. And we got the entity outside. By the time they found out that we had the entity outside the perimeter, uh, they went ahead and was very upset. And now they were even to the point where they even tried to shoot the entity. But the entity was now in a position where and then it was a bright, bright, bright light that came down. And I didn't even get to see the craft. And maybe it was because I just wasn't looking. Uh, but all of a sudden, this entity was there, then it wasn't. Mm. Then, of course, the guy I always called the colonel, he went ahead and told me, well, I'd be court-martialed, then well, we're all going to overlook it this time, but don't let that happen again. And, of course, I was chastising him. If they're supposed to be our guests, why were we treating them cruel and treating them as prisoners? As a matter of fact, even worse than prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, the... I, I have never seen either movie of the Manchurian Candidate. Okay. And the one thing that we had, we had identified by the time I got out, uh, 57 different species. And they were affectionately called the Heinz 57. I understand there's some phrase in one of those movies about that. Mm -hmm. uh, gee, I'd love to say there's only two or three races or only... Uh, four or five or even one. 
I'd love to say that. But with what I know, if I change anything that I do know, then it's not reality. It's just going ahead saying things that people want to hear. Uh huh. Well, why would you say you would want to say there was only one or two? Oh, well, some people, well, we could find your story more believable if you could I say. I see. And, gee, can't this entity be gray because it'd be more believable? Uh-huh. What do you want, a story that's believable, or do you want the truth? Mm -hmm. Now, the truth may not fit what you believe, but it's the truth as I know it. And with it being the truth as I know it, that's all I can tell. So have you ever, um, I'm going to assume they must photograph these beings, right? There's photographs. Okay. And what about you? Do you ever draw them? Do you have drawings of them? Yeah, i got some drawings. And, and have you distributed, no. have you, are you able at liberty to, to give them out at all or show them? Some I have and some I haven't. Uh -huh. And are you familiar with um, underground bases? and the technology it goes along with it. Okay. And so I'm going to assume you've been to underground bases yourself. Not by choice. Not by choice. That's believable. But have you um, also seen, say, reptilians, what we are, what's called, you know, in the UFO community, Some species re reptilians. That you call reptilian, yes. Mm -hmm. And are you able to communicate with them telepathically? They can communicate with you. Okay. It's, it's hard to explain. You can't keep secrets. Sure. And the other thing I'd remind everyone is the program is geared and set up to where you only, have a, you only know what you have a need to know. And a lot of times you know more than what you're supposed to know. Mm -hmm. But you don't know everything. Sure. And I reiterate, anybody that tells you that they know everything is a liar. It's not true. Oh. Do you have any special alien friends that have remained with you throughout that are with you today? Communicating? I one. I'm sorry? I mentioned one. One. Okay, that would be uh, uh, Corona? Correct. Okay. And Corona is, um, do you know what planet he's from? Mm -mm. You don't? Okay. I know it's about 100 light years away from here because I always use that as an example. Okay. Real time, from the time they leave, and there's a little nice thing about that, from the time they leave their home planet, which is in a star, a star system about 100 light years from planet Earth, in real time travel, it's an hour and four, 40 minutes. That's from marvelous. From the time they leave yeah. and arrive here. What kind of craft do they use? Do they teleport? Through space, or do they actually take a craft? Because not all of them. No, it, it's a craft. If it's craft. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's. They're really traveling. Okay. But it's through a traversable, what we call a traversable wormhole. Uh huh. Now, have you ever gone with them? To the best of my knowledge, no. And the reason I state that, I can remember seeing the stars that, I've never seen them like that anywhere on Earth. But to the best of my knowledge, no. So you don't have conscious memory, is what you mean? Right of these incidents, but you could have. Oh, well, there's been some things really scary that's happened in my life. I mean, you feel it. You actually feel the fear before you actually see the entity. Mm -hmm. And So a person like you, we would think that you would not be afraid because you are so conscious of your interaction with these beings that I'm surprised to hear you say that you're actually afraid. Are you afraid to this day, or are you talking past Oh, when I have these incidents tense? happen, yeah, you still have that fear. I mean, uh -huh. that fear is there. Okay. Even more so because you can feel the fear they have. Okay. We're a very dangerous species. Sure. So you better believe if they fall into our hands, there is that fear. Okay. So, and this is part of the reason why I'm going to assume they approach you as a communicator or interfacer, as you call it, right? Well, they're very concerned about our well-being. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that can't be so. Yeah, they are. We've done terrible things to ourselves. And they know this. Mm -hmm. And we, they're trying to understand certain things about us. And I think at the same time they're exchanging information saying, hey, here's what you've done to yourself. 
I think that ties in a lot with some of the abductions that have taken place. I think it ties in with some of the cattle mutilations that have taken place. Um, and I think it ties in with some of the people absolutely disappearing off the face of the earth. Okay, so there are people that are disappearing on a regular basis, right? Oh, yes. Um, and they're going to other planets, they're going to um, off-world bases, I'm assuming? I don't have the answer to that. Okay. Now, if you're asking me if I could have left here, possibly. But, like I say, there's a purpose. And I don't know what that purpose is. Is your mission to make people aware not only of the entity, the other entities out there and other, you know, races and so on, but is it also to perhaps prepare or to warn of some event? Because you seem to be alluding to some event that you don't even know about. As two points far out, they're becoming closer and closer together to eventually, and we ultimately know it's going to happen, contact's going to be made. The NASA Department of Astrobiology held a conference in 2000. Forget the Brookings Institute report. This report came out and said, you know, we don't really know what world reaction would be. It's a small report. How many people have read that report? How many people even know about it? When we say that we can accept the reality of visitors being here, we mean us ourselves. But even when we can accept that, how many of us are really ready for that face-to-face -face con confrontation? And I can tell you, each time it's different. Each time there is that little something in the back of your mind that says what's going to happen here mm -hmm. and each time you know that if something goes wrong it's going to equate it could equate to the loss of life not because they're dangerous but we're a danger to ourselves so the whole situation is how do you prepare, prepare a world population for that ultimate contact which isn't as Astro astronomers used to believe that it's going to be by a radio signal from deep space coming here. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be face to face and it's going to happen on our planet. Sure. Well, it's happening daily with the military, is it not? I mean, all more so than what people really know. But here again, most people aren't going to talk about it. Right. The one thing you want when you get out of the military, the one thing you want more than anything, is to be normal. You Why? Why? Why do you want to be normal? To me, the greatest thing you can be is a servant. Taking care of other people is the most important thing. The self, the self should get gratif gratification from being able to help other people. That's important. But all too often, uh, people will put themselves ahead of others. And right there is where we have the problems today, in today's world. I guess to, to get back to where you were saying there's going to be contact, in a sense, you are in the forefront a person who can prepare the rest of humanity for this actual contact, because you've been having contact. And in a sense, the aliens or the off-worlders have basically been communicating, been choosing the people around the planet to communicate with, of which you are one, right? And so contact is something that is being prepared for as we speak. Is Worldwide. it not? Okay. And are you thinking, um, you know, a lot of people like to say, it's going to happen for the world to see, aliens are going to land on the White House lawn, something of this nature. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, I mean, in a certain sense, it's going on every day. The military is dealing with, I'm um, certainly they've captured, as you say, they're holding prisoner. 
some some of these entities. I mean, we've also had treaties with some of the races, have we not? Okay, I've heard about the treaties, but here again, that's not part of something I'd work with. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you this, I think by 2016, that something better have happened, because in 2016, I think we're going to have to announce to the world that there's a probe that comes very close to the Earth every uh, 15, 20 years. An a we've been calling it an asteroid. It's not an asteroid. Mm -hmm. But it actually, in reality, is an artificial probe. In other words, somebody else put it here. They have found us a long time ago. The technology will probably be pretty much on par to, say, Voyager. It will be old, old antiquated technology by the, all their standards. So what are you saying? This probe, is this probe, um, do you know what race? I'm saying we already found it. Uh -huh. Our paradigm says that it can't be a artificial craft of any sort. Therefore, we refuse to accept that and we call it an asteroid. I'm talking about BG 1991, roughly 30, uh, 30 meters in diameter. Highly polished surface. Asteroids don't have a high polished surface. Took, cor uh, took corrective uh, uh, course changes to avoid collision with another asteroid. That don't happen. Mm -hmm. This one it did. So where, what race is this from? What planet do you know? I don't know. Do you think that the aliens have given you an upgrade, have modified your DNA in any way? Are you aware that you've that your abilities have been augmented or have grown? Yeah, but you try not to use those because you you can you know of things that's going to happen before they happen, mm -hmm. and a lot of times you can't do anything to change them. Oh. Uh, Like, I knew that, didn't know who, but I knew one of my kids was going to get killed on the motorcycle. And that's hard. I mean, before my son was killed, on the Wednesday prior to that, I knew that uh, he parked the motorcycle in the back of the car. I knew I could go ahead, back up over it, and run over it a couple of times. But I also knew that the family would not understand that I did that to stop what was, uh, let me rephrase that, as an attempt to stop what I knew was going to happen. So but, you're a precog. I mean, this is what they call a precog. You, you knew in the future before it happened, and that you were not able to necessarily change it or stop it. Um, but there's a reason why things happen, I mean, you must agree. Oh, so, yeah. so, so, in a sense, that must be a piece for you because it's not just that we, that you know, but also souls know what might happen. Souls are aware. In other words, we're all aware when we're going to die. We may not know it consciously, but we do know, right? Um, so, in that sense, I mean, it, it it's not your responsibility either to prevent a happening or not if that's something in a sense that we as souls agreed to the scenario happening, right? Well, like I say with them, they can even communicate with what we call the other side. But even at that, given their advanced technology, there are still forbidden questions. Okay. I'm trying to avoid saying something here. Let's just say that with the death of my son, they helped me visit with him one time. Sure. And like I told you, there's questions unless you ever ask. It was, I knew if I go back 15 minutes, I knew where he was, all those locations. If I could go back 15 minutes, I could stop the accident from happening. All I had to do was delay his movement anywhere as long as 15 minutes. 
for just a minute or so. And I would alter the outcome. But, but once again, it's that break off. Here's our reality. Here you created that other parallel. And for some odd reason, it's not good to create that out of the parallel. And they know this. Mm -hmm. And also, it was pointed out that you cannot escape the reality of this time continuum that we find ourselves. Because his death is reality to me in this, in this time frame I find myself. The Second World War happened. I must return to the point from which I depart within that space-time. Uh -huh. I'm not going to remain in the other one. And a lot of people, you know, like they said the other night, you'd stay there. No, because it was pointed out to me quite clear. And I can't explain this. I couldn't go and debate it scientific excuse me, scientifically. But it's a natural barrier, which is why when uh, time travel, when we discovered in our future, we're not going to find evidence of it being left any place along the line because of that natural barrier. We may even see them. We may sense them. We may even be able to interact to a degree, but nothing associated with the future tied with the day we discover time travel is going to be left in any altered reality. They say, okay, time travel uh, hasn't happened yet because we would have evidence of it. Uh-uh. There won't be any evidence left. Uh -huh. And there's a natural barrier there. Mm -hmm. The whole situation is we are a part of something greater, more vast, and we're on an adventure. And we're part of that adventure. Mm -hmm. And we all play certain parts in that. But just like when you brought it up about they are us. And I said, he's heard me say this, which is probably he got a grin on his face when no. you said that. But the whole situation is we look for the differences in the species, the 57th, look for the similarities. When we look for those similarities, we then begin to realize just how much we have in common and eventually we come to the point of one thought they are us because everything within the universe is interconnected all species are, are interconnected mm -hmm. anybody ever ask why the common denominator is humanoid you would not expect to find that if there was not some type of galactic blueprint. You become spiritually enlightened by going through this life. Mm -hmm. Even those that we say are insane. On the other side, they're not insane. Maybe we could find out a little bit about the types of visitors that you've dealt with. Do you see them physically or do you, um, are you ac actually sort of in an altered state? Or are you able to see them in your mind? And do you communicate with them telepathically? Well, they're as physical as you and I. Okay. And yes, it would be telepathic. Mm -hmm. uh, some could talk just like you and I. Okay. But you'll have uh, a lot that uh, they won't do that, and they all just want to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's one thing you have to keep in mind. This is what a lot of people overlook, and that's why it gets to be so hard to talk about. You're not just talking to them. They know, and they feel everything that you know and you feel. You, you go in, you feel what they feel. And 
and see some of these, we weren't real good guys. We use the term visitor. Sure. But they're treated like prisoners. I understand. And there is no outlaw uh, under protection to protect them. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Burrish has talked about this as well. In 1960, and I can provide you with the document, we have put together and formulated, NASA did, a book that, calls, that they call Outer Space Law. It would be not it would not be until the 1970s that the question of the legal rights of an essentient being, not of this world, even came into play. Mm -hmm. And you know what those rights are? There aren't any. Still, to this day, you're saying? No more than what the rights would, a lab animal would have more rights than one of our visitors, and yet they are vastly superior to us in intellect, mm -hmm. and even in spirituality. They would permit themselves to be killed, many of them would, many of the species, other than to do something that would cause us to get injured or killed. Hmm. And forgive me, but you know, this is what I'm trying to avoid. I understand. Well, oh, okay, so they, in a certain sense, would sacrifice themselves because they have a deeper understanding of what's really going on than we do. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so you must be a very um, highly tuned spiritual being yourself in order to be able to communicate with various races from other planets um, the way you have and to talk about it the way you do. And, you know, that's, that's really a gift. As you say, it's, it's not something taught. It's something you come into this incarnation with. Well... I like to think of myself. I want to be normal, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay. Um, well, from you know, I, I know what you're saying. You appear like a normal, a normal person, and you've certainly held some very normal types of jobs, um, in addition to what you did, right? Um, but you're also ultra normal, or you know, you you actually have used some of the um, parts of, of humanity that are good parts that are not used by the average man. Is that right? Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so that's a beautiful thing, and, and, and we're really um, happy to meet someone, you know, in person who's been doing this. Well, with me, I think the one thing that... Let me see if I can say this and get it through real quick. When I was young, I played with children that other people couldn't see. To me, this was per perfectly normal. And I knew about the imaginary friends and things of this sort, but this was different. And it was perfectly normal. They had even helped me with my homework. And this was perfectly normal. Now, no one else could see these people. And, of course, I couldn't understand that, but, of course, they would tell me. Uh, you know, they haven't been selected. They can't see us. Sure. Because I was trying to tell other people that were there. The one thing I could not do is that in being normal, I thought other people had these same experiences. As a child, not realizing that that wasn't the case. That was part of my environment. That was part of my reality. These were things that was happening to me. But I felt... Everyone had these experiences. But when I found out and it came to me that, you know, people were calling you crazy and you were different, it would have been real easy to be normal and say, ha ha, the joke's on you and deny what was happening. Sure. I cannot explain why I couldn't do that, but I could not do that. Okay. And everything was, you know, going on. Nothing out of the real ordinary happened until I always cared about animals, and if I found one injured, I would always try to nurse it back to health. As a child, I did not understand that if you had a cut, my mom would always hold my hand under the water or something like that to wash it off. Well, I found this little bird. It fell out of the nest. 
and I went and got that little, I'm trying to tell this without, I went and got that little bird and I held it under the faucet, not realizing that I was going to drown it doing that. The intent was to help it. I probably cried for over a week over killing that little bird. Immediately, for the first time ever, the ch what I was calling children, I got to see how they really looked. And this one particular en entity was, I always knew as Corona. I was told, I'm Corona, and that's with a K. Okay. Back at the time, I didn't even know how to spell Corona. And what kind of race, what what, um, what would you term him, what kind of being? Well, people would love for me to say that he was gray, but he wasn't, he was green. And okay. I mean, like a pastel green. Uh -huh. uh, but immediately he wanted to know why did I feel what I was feeling. Okay. This was unusual. Mm -hmm. And immediately it was why did I feel what I was feeling but he could feel. Mm -hmm. Because he was more like a monitor with me. And so he's, he has a natural em empathic quality and abilities, and it appears so did you. So it went both ways, as the telepathy goes both ways. I'll carry it even a step further. We see that our visitors as cartoon characters. They have cultures, they have societies, they have families, they have loves, they have dislikes, they have likes. Mm -hmm. uh, they can feel pain, and they can feel fear. Mm -hmm. So, this this was maybe your first, um, you know, introduction into that world um, in a more personal way, right? It was the first glimpse, a shock, that these things go on, but not everyone shares in them. Mm -hmm. And so you never felt as long, so alone. I can remember breaking down and crying, begging my mom and dad to take me to see a doctor because I knew the doctor could make the monsters go away. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if someone like you, one of seven, who is a bit able to communicate with aliens, um, wasn't taken to a base on the moon or a base on Mars. Now, whether or not you remember it, because I don't know if they use techniques for, to have you forget certain parts of your experience. There are things that I have no, no idea of could have happened here on planet Earth that I have very vivid mem memories of that I don't see. For example, have you ever heard of a coffee cup that's small that you put coffee in it and it, the, the uh, coffee jar or whatever, uh, it's not a percolator, golden collar, cups were golden collar, but you put the coffee in there and you can drink it, then it fills right back up. Now you see what I'm saying, and now you understand why I'm hesitant to talk too much about stuff like that. Okay. Um, so that's, I mean, that's really amazing. You know, I, you have to admit, I'm from the point of view of people that haven't gone to the moon, and, and, and in a sense, or, or Mars. Um, I mean, here you are sitting talking to us, and yet you may have had experiences that are so far beyond our everyday experience on this planet. And you must be, I mean, there must be a level at which you would love to share those experiences. Oh, yeah. And sometimes I make mistakes, and I've let people see some things that, I shouldn't have let him see, because this is a part of something that is in my life that is I'm to do something with. Sure. And I don't understand that. I don't know what it is. That's amazing because you've worked with this world so since the '60s. So you're talking about forty odd years, and you're still wondering, um, like, what it is it's all about for you in terms of your destiny, in terms of what it is you're, you're here to do in the future, I guess. Am, am I understanding you? There's something that is going to happen 
and there is something that we're to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that is. You were starting in, like you said, the 1960s as, as an interfacer. Late 1960s. Okay. And I'm going to assume clear up to today because you don't lose the skill. And if you're one of seven, you know, every once in a while they got to come knocking on your door. Well, they check on you from time to time. Okay. Visitors out there are different communities. They certainly know how to find you, where you are at any given time, and how to, as you say, see what it is you're going through. For yeah. example, they could be seeing this going on right now. They could even have said to you, you know, um, go ahead with this because this is a good thing, right? So in a sense, you're talking about your destiny, meaning it's not about money, it's not even really a job in the formal sense, the word, right? It's a mission, but it's an earthly mission, in a sense, that you have. Yeah, I, I, I would go along with that, that, that there's, you're being driven to do something. You don't have to fully understand it, but it's something you have to do. Mm -hmm. And the other scary aspect about it, you know, you, you don't know why, and you don't know what but it's coming to an apex that what you're doing you're fighting the clock okay is the clock 2012 is that the clock here you're looking at I, I don't know you don't know. and a lot of people say gee if you worked with this you you have all the an you don't have all the answers mm -hmm. and he who comes up and tells you they have all the answers is not being truthful with you sure uh, you don't know what it is it why would one want to go ahead, be in this field, subject themselves to ridicule? Uh, and there are family problems. The situation is my family don't understand this. Oh. Uh, they've been around enough that they know my wife more so than my kids. But uh, I guess my daughter in Vietnam uh, we had a daughter we had been fighting to get out of Vietnam for almost 30 years. Anyhow, when she came over, well, of course, she had her own family with her. And uh, when we started to talk about UFOs, they all knew about it. They all knew about certain things I was involved in. And it was the government of Vietnam that told them, oh. which kind of shocked me. Uh-huh. And right now there is a tremendous interest among a lot of the people in Vietnam about UFOs. Oh, really? One of the first things that happened in Vietnam was, and they called me by my proper name. Most people call me Stony or Cliff. But the, and we shot at these guys. And I was the first one to pull the trigger. And it was, Clifford, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And I was in the military and we were on a mission. But... The strange thing is that, what were they trying to say, that I wasn't supposed to be in the military? Now remember, the military is here on Earth, that's man's. Sure. Uh, our visitors, what did they plan for me to do? Well, can you answer your question? I mean... I, I have no answers. I have more questions than you have about myself. <laughs> Two or three times I got out of the UFO field but you won't tell you a little secret? You can't. There are people out there, and I'm one of them. It's not about money. God, I wish it was. I struggle every, and he can tell you, every month just to make my bills. Mm -hmm. It's more than that. But the hardest thing to do right now is to make people think for themselves and to read. If they think for themselves and they read the documentation that's out there, and I'm referring to the, the government's own evidence, if they read that, mm -hmm. with an open mind, they have to come away and say, you know, there's more to this. Something is going on. Sure. Then the only questions left to be answered are these. What's going on? How much does our government know, and when did they know it? 
Okay, well, we want to thank you for your courage and for your um, integrity and for your spiritual um, development or awareness that um, makes you able to communicate with these off-worlders at a time when few on the planet are able to do so consciously. There were times that we were just minutes away from going to a nuclear exchange because of UFO sightings. Sure. Thanks to the, uh, the hotline that was set up, which the American people were truthfully told this was to ensure that there wasn't a nuclear war started by accident due to false returns. And of course, everybody had war scares. UFOs were a reality. UFOs existed. They were being reported. They were being picked up on radar. Mm -hmm. You had both radar, uh, radar, and, uh, uh, radar and radar visuals that was taking place. You had fighters trying to intercept them. So in order to reassure one another that we're not doing this, and it should have been commonplace that if we had this technology, or if they had that technology, there was nothing the other side could do anyhow. We had missiles that would be uh, knocked out, not destroyed, but made incapable of firing. Mm -hmm. We had fighter aircraft that would fire on UFOs, and their weapons wouldn't work. You, you actually have used some of the um, parts of, of humanity that are good parts that are not used by the average man. Is that right? Well, I hope so. 